We're back again, once again, with John DeLeo to talk about his book, There Are No Small Parts. And he's going to tell us about the druggist in It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, uh, Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life from 1946, one of the most beloved of old movies of all time. Even though it wasn't that beloved at the time it came out, its reputation really got rolling in the 70s. And now it's such a perennial. I mean, every it's most people's favorite Christmas movie and all of that. I think one of the things that um, gets sort of lost in the shuffle is uh, what a dark film it really is. And the fact that we love it so much is that, you know, it has a happy ending. But because we've been put through the ringer emotionally, because it goes to some really dark places and that it really earns that happy ending. Mm -hmm. And so you have this amazing catharsis of emotion having been through something. So when it's talked about as a gooey, sentimental movie, it, it's really not. It, it goes to some very scary places. And the uh, in terms of who in the movie to write about, in terms of who gives a great under 10 minute performance. I don't think I had any doubt. I mean, there were other options, but H.B. Warner, who plays Mr. Gower or Old Man Gower, as they sometimes call him, the druggist, uh, because some a lot of the darkness, uh, some of the darkest elements of that darkness come from him. And he's only in the movie for three and a half minutes. Wow. And uh, when it starts and we see young George Bailey, who's going to grow up to be Jimmy Stewart, there's that scene where he works like after school at the druggist and H.B. Warner, uh, as Mr. Gower, has just found out that his son has died and he's in a horrible mood and he takes it out on young George and he slaps the kid around. And it's the first element of darkness that we see in this story. And it's still very upsetting to watch this sort of old man slapping around a young boy who hasn't really done anything wrong and has protected the druggist from uh, sending out a prescription with poison in it. Mm -hmm. And then when he finds out, he's grateful to the kid thereafter. And then he's really nice in the few things. I mean, he's hardly in the movie. As I said, he's in it for three and a half minutes. When he comes back in the fantasy sequence, when the angel Clarence shows George the world, if George had never been born, the first element of darkness in that sort of nightmare, dream, fantasy, whatever you want to call it, is when Jimmy Stewart goes into the bar and Mr. Gower comes in and he's clearly drunk and homeless and pathetic because without George, he went to prison because he poisoned someone uh -huh. with that, that prescription. And what I love about what H.B. Warner does is that he, it, it's not only the things I said, drunk, homeless, it, it it's reaches a level of patheticness that is really devastating. And when the crowd mocks him, he laughs along. I mean, it is so deeply heartbreaking. And um, when it comes out of it for the happy ending and Mr. Gower shows up to put money in the kitty to help George, save George's business at the end, when we see Mr. Gower as himself, you know, happy, successful, he didn't go to prison, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's such a relief both on Jimmy Stewart's face and for everyone in the audience because we can't really shake that image of when he came in doddering and, uh, like I said, a, a level of, of darkness. Um, and then it's so it, it's such a great moment to see him <laughs> smiling and yeah. all. And um, like I said, though, that scene's toward the end, the, the drugstore scenes at the beginning... And they really stick, I think, like I said, the, the darkness in those scenes, all of it building and building and building to that great, cathartic, happy ending. Yeah, it really is interesting how it almost erases your memory of the happy ending, it almost erases your memory of those things. Yeah. Because, again, when you say them, like, yeah. you know, they were there, but, yeah. but you, you ended up with that happy feeling. I think even psychologists say you remember happiness and pleasure better than you remember pain. Like yeah. pain, for some reason, you yeah. turn it off, you don't try not to watch it. So and, I mean, a lot of it comes from Jimmy Stewart, too. I mean, he really goes uh, to some really dark places right before the Clarence, the angel, comes into it when he's being, you know, awful to his family, right. saying you're just being in such a horrible mood and taking it out on people. And... And, you know, the self-pity uh, that he feels, uh, why did this happen to me? How did I get here? Um, and it is, it is a great performance. H.B. Warner was, uh, in the silent era, he starred as Jesus Christ in Cecil B. DeMille's The King of Kings in 1927. Wow. 
And then he was nominated for an Oscar for another Frank Capra film in the 30s, uh, Lost Horizon. That was Silent 2? No, that's 1937. That's um, Shangri-La mm -hmm. uh, with Ronald Coleman. That was that was a big deal movie in 1937. So uh, he had a long, distinguished career. Um, but, you know, it's so funny. If you're in a classic movie, you're forever whatever age you were, <laughs> <Right. laughs> whether you're a child or an old man. Yeah. So he is... Anyone who sees him in anything else, like, oh, there's old man Gower, the druggist, uh, mm -hmm. from It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't an issue at So all. he was what they call classically trained. Yeah, he, he was actually from <clears throat> England. So, yeah, he, um, um, yeah, uh, so many of those older people in movies were people with long histories in the theater as young people. And by the time the talkies came around, they were old people. And that's how they preserved for all of us. And anything else for him after this that's noteworthy? No, this is, um, he, he's still in stuff, uh, but this is really, this is the one. This is the one. He's but it's such a small role, like I said, a lot of the performances in there are no small parts. We're not nominated for an Oscar, you know, as indelible, as wonderful as they are, it's so small that you're unlikely to win an Oscar for three and a half minutes or even get nominated. Right. But, you should almost get it more if you can make that well, much of an impact in three and a half minutes. Maybe the, they'll reconsider after they read yeah. this. But. <laughs> it doesn't take away from his greatness or, or many of the other people yeah. in the book. Yeah, but, to, to have a powerful impact in three and a half minutes yeah. must be harder than having a powerful yes. impact in right. an hour. Right. So Yes, that is true. And some people have, in the book, did get nominations and have couple of them won but primarily it's uh, just there's just no way there's a, there's about i think it's uh, 11 of the uh, 100 were nominated for oscars and only two of them won judy dench in shakespeare in love and beatrice Strait in network yeah. and it was a big deal in both cases that they won for roles that were less than 10 minutes <laughs> So thanks again john for everything we always always really a pleasure and i always feel like i learned so much i leave much smarter than when I came in, which I guess is pretty easy for me. But <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say I, that. I, 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 thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Nick. John's <laughs> book is There Are No Small Parts, 100 Outstanding Performances with Screen Time of 10 Minutes or Less. And if you like this video, check out the No Small Parts playlist on this channel for more of the same. Thank you.